everyone, welcome. We're gonna give folks a few minutes to jump on here. While we give folks a minute to, to come on and get settled, I wanna take this moment to remind you all to close out of your email, close out any internal messaging platforms, something I've been trying to be better about myself when I attend events and webinars to just stay present, enjoy what's in front of me and engage with it. I know we can all use the reminder, so sharing in case that's helpful. Hi everyone, welcome. I was just passing on a note to invite you all to close out of email if you haven't already. It's nice to take a moment to remind ourselves to focus. We've got some great speakers today, so really excited to, to cover all of this with you. Okay, I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. We've got two excellent speakers and I wanna make sure we, we get all of their content covered. So, um, Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Uh, we've got some really great uh, action items here and inviting you to be a global champion for refugees. Um, I know there's a lot going on domestically and internationally, so appreciate you, you know, taking the time to be present and, and, and really show up for refugees and displaced people. This is an important step that you can take to help raise awareness and, and support this vital work. We're gonna walk you through a few activities today that support International Rescue Committee and Refugees International's missions and share giving opportunity with you all that we have with Global Impacts Refugee Fund. My name is Jillian Wagner and I'm going to be moderating today's discussion and I'm with Global Impact. Our mission is to inspire greater giving and I really hope that that's the, the mission we're gonna be living out today. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This is a webinar, so your line is going to be on mute to avoid any distractions, but we want you to utilize the chat and the question function. So in that chat box, any reflections, reactions you have for the panelists, please do share. Feel free to introduce yourselves and say where you're joining from today. And then in that Q&A function, I really invite you to share any questions that you have for our panelists, anything at all. We wanna make sure we get to it. And you have the option to vote for questions that you wanna support and really see answered. So. Um, be sure to, to go check those out and, and make sure that we're getting all of your most pressing questions answered. So let's go ahead and just dive right in. So I'm so excited to introduce Kim Pompey, the Associate Director of Employee Engagement and Workplace Giving at the International Rescue Committee. We've also got Audrey Smith, the Digital Engagement and Donor Communications Manager at Refugees International. Kim is going to go ahead and kick us off today. Thank you so much for joining us, Kim. You're on mute, Kim. First of many, perfect, all right. Hello everyone, thank you so much. It's so great to be here. I'm um, pleased that you were able to uh, join us today and I'm, and I'm so gracious to be invited to speak to you about the International Rescue Committee. Also um, excited to be partnering with Audrey today with, um, her organization as well, Refugees International. Next slide. Okay. So I have a bit of an overview, just a quick agenda on what I'd like to cover. I'll give an IRC overview, and then we're going to take a bit of a take action activity today. We're going to ask you to participate by um, sharing some of your talent and skills. And then during the session, we'll also explore some of IRC's programming in Afghanistan, Syria, and Somalia. And then we'll conclude the session with some other ways potentially that you can help support our work. Next slide. Okay, so a little bit about who we are. So let's start off with an overview of the IRC and who we are. So the International Rescue Committee, it was founded in 1933. It was founded at the call of Albert Einstein. 
we first help people fleeing violence and persecution in Europe and help them find safety in the United States. And since then, we've been working to support people whose lives have been shattered by conflict and disaster to survive, recover, and rebuild their lives. And we do this in more than 40 countries across the globe and 25 cities in the US. We deliver lasting impact by providing healthcare. We help children learn. We empower individuals and communities to become self-reliant, always with a focus on the unique needs of women and girls. Next slide. So a little bit about our, sorry for a minute there. And there's a total of record number of 100 million people globally that have been uprooted from their homes. It's an increase of 20% compared to a little over 82 million that were displaced at the end of 2020. And displaced means that uh, this is someone that had to flee their home, but they stay within the borders of their country. And overall, the number of displaced persons has more than doubled in the last 10 years alone. And the numbers reflect the almost 90 million people displaced by ongoing conflict and disaster in countries such as Afghanistan, Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Ethiopia, and Venezuela. Some of these uh, organizations in areas we will touch on today. And please note that this 100 million people displaced, that includes 14 million Ukrainians who were forced to flee their homes. And it's historic, but it will be the prelude to higher and higher numbers if we don't take urgent action. And this is not simply just the greatest displacement figure the world has seen since World War II, but it's also nearly equal to the populations of the United Kingdom and Canada combined. And in this image, this is an image pictured here of Simon Bolivar Bridge in Colombia. And up to 37,000 people cross the bridge from Venezuela into Colombia each day. Next slide. A little bit about our impact. So because the need is so great, the IRC responds in a multifaceted way. So this shows a snapshot of how we empowered our clients in 2021. And as a part of our work, the IRC provided 31 and a half million people with access to health services. We built or rehabilitated water supplies serving 2.7 million people with clean water and enrolled a little over 370,000 children and youth in learning programs. So we are always looking to make a greater impact. Next slide. Okay, so this is a point where we're going to ask you to, to do a take action activity. We are going to ask you to create messages of welcome and support. This could be a letter, this could be a poem, this could be a picture, but we'd like you to write a letter or a message of encouragement or record a, vis a video message to contribute to the digital mural for our refugees, asylees, and immigrants. And these messages should express hope and encouragement and let the newcomers know that we're happy that they're here. And as they begin their new life, you know, we wanna reassure them that they are surrounded by a community that wants to help them succeed. So I'm going to drop a link in the CUDA board chat, which is where you should submit your creations. And what you'll see here is I've provided some examples of some of the language that you could use. Uh, please note that we like the language to be positive and uplifting. But if you speak another language and are willing to provide that uh, message in another language, please feel free to do that. So I'm going to put this in the chat now. And hopefully everyone can see that. So uh, while we're moving forward and you're learning more about our organizations, just anything that comes to heart, it's gonna make such a difference in the refugees' lives. So we appreciate your help with that. Okay, 
Moving on to the next slide. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit about Afghanistan. So as you may know, just last week, on June 22nd, actually, we uh, Afghanistan re experienced a 5.9 magnitude earthquake. It struck the Paktika and coast provinces of Afghanistan. It caused catastrophic damage. Um, we know that it's killed at the upwards of a thousand people. And as the situation has developed, the IRC has deployed mobile health teams and those are already operating in the region to coast and is providing emergency cash support. Just so that you know, Pakistan has always also been impacted. You know, the IRC has been in Afghanistan for over 30 years. We are on the ground responding to the earthquake by deploying those mobile health teams. We're working with authorities to provide other support, including cash assistance. We're also assessing the area with the United Nations Office for the Co Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs as the situation develops. And as the numbers of those who have lost their lives in a deadly earthquake continue to rise, the RC has deployed emergency teams to the affected provinces to provide life-saving assistance to the thousands of people left stranded amid this unfortunate catastrophe. And like I said, we are providing cash support to families who've lost their homes and livelihoods. And unfortunately, the already stretched health system, including the regional hospital that serves the provinces of Coast and Pactica, will require even more support to cope with the needs caused by the earthquake. So now the IRC has stayed in Afghanistan through crisis after crisis, and you know we will stay and deliver now. Our team supports 68 health facilities across the country. We run 30 mobile health teams across nine provinces. We are coordinating with other NGOs on the ground to better understand the scale and impact of the disaster and to ensure that resources and capacity across the sector are distributed to reach the most people in need. And as you may know, decades of violent conflict and natural disasters in Afghanistan have created one of the world's largest refugee populations, and humanitarian needs have only skyrocketed since the shift. Over 680,000 people were internally displaced in Afghanistan last year alone. And it's been 10 months now since the new government has uh, taken over territory control in the war-torn country. And unfortunately, the country could see near universal poverty in 2022 with 97% of Afghans at risk. In the recent years, we've become a leader in women's protection and empowerment in Afghanistan. And in this photo, uh, Muhammad Wali and his daughters stand outside their family's makeshift home in Kabul, which unfortunately endured a brutal winter. Okay, next slide. So I also wanted to provide a, a story of hope. So refugee uh, resettlement doesn't end when the plane lands, right? When someone arrives at their new home, it's, it's critical that they receive the support they need to build new lives. And Shaquille, he bikes 30 minutes every day to work as a mechanic in Wichita, which is where he resettled. He doesn't own a car, but he's saving money for one and back home, he was an officer in the Afghan military, working closely with the US Special Forces in Jalalabad, where he lived with his wife and their two young children. Now, Shaquille fled Kabul and flew to Kuwait. And then when he arrived in the United States, he and his family spent several months in a military base before going to Wichita. Fortunately, they had family and friends that could help them resettle there. And what the IRC has done is that we've been helping Afghan refugees resettle since last October, especially since uh, the conflict endured. And we provide intensive help for refugees first 90 days and continued support beyond that. So for us, the IRC, we like to be at the airport the moment that they land and help 
the refugees walk off the plane for the first time so that when they arrive that first night, we take them hopefully to a home with furniture, groceries that they can put in the refrigerator. Now moving on to Syria, we have a short video we'd like to show. Oh, we have to share the sound. Apologies, Kim. Is the audio not working? No. Hmm. That's okay. We can put it in. We can put the link in the chat. Great idea. Thanks, Kim. <laughs> Sorry about that, everyone. No worries. Well, since the conflict exploded in Syria in 2011, millions of people have fled their homes. And in 2021, there were almost 7 million refugees and asylum seekers from Syria around the world, more than from any other country at that time. And more than half of the Syrians are displaced from their homes, which makes Syria the world's largest displacement crisis. Now, women and children are particularly vulnerable to a range of safety issues, including sexual violence, early marriage, child labor, and physical and mental trauma. Now, what the video was depicting was the resilience of women um, who have been affected by the crisis in Syria, some of the challenges they faced, um, but the hope and the optimism that they still endure. So the IFC team supports early childhood development and we provide counseling protection services for women. We support health facilities and mobile health teams with life-saving trauma services and with primary reproductive and mental health services. We also provide food and emergency cash assistance to help displaced families meet their immediate needs. And we support Syrian refugees in Jordan, Iraq, and Lebanon. Okay, next slide. So IOC's mindfulness programs have helped students like 12-year-old Mohammed, who was forced to leave his home in Syria behind the war, behind when the war became un unbearable. Now, the majority of Syrians had access to education, employment, and homes surrounded by neighbors and family. But in 2015, Mohammed and his family of eight fled their hometown to leave behind daily violence, brutality, and security. And before arriving in Lebanon, life in Syria was becoming more and more challenging. And Mohammed had missed many days of school, and there were large gaps in his basic education. So by grade three, the violence became so bad that he no longer went to school. So to meet learning and social emotional needs of Syrian refugee children like Mohammed, the IRC established a remedial education program that integrated mindfulness activities into the daily routines. And you can see here how Muhammad is engaging in a mindfulness activity, and you can read his words on what mindfulness has meant to him. And he shares how it's helped him calm down when nervous and also helped him improve academically. Next slide. And finally, Somalia. So Somalia has been plagued by ongoing conflict and life-threatening droughts for decades. Three consecutive seasons without enough rainfall have left farming communities struggling to cultivate crops and keep livestock alive to eat and sell. And as the drought continues to threaten the lives and livelihoods of more than 29 million people across the region, urgent humanitarian assistance is needed to avert mass suffering. And Somalia, without a scale-up of humanitarian assistance, over 4 million people could have acute food shortages due to the lack of crops and livelihoods in 2022. So needless to say, the situation has deteriorated with the current drought, wiping out crop harvests and livestock. So the IRC has worked in Somalia since 2007. Uh, we operate in four cities 
and we exist in the operational presence in Puntland and Galmudug states, which are among the hardest hit by the drought. And we're leveraging its operational footprint in both locations to scale up and expand our primary health care services, nutrition outreach, treatments, livelihoods, emergency cash, and protection for those most affected. And in this photo, this is for Dumo. Uh, her community in Somalia has faced severe shortage of water. And during the drought, as people risk dying of thirst, the IRC drilled a well and that's what she's using, providing life-saving water amid the worst drought in 40 years. Next slide. So one last story of hope. So social emotional learning activities are increasingly being integrated into schooling across the world. And if you happen to have a school-aged child, it's likely this is an aspect of their education too. So social emotional learning skills, also known as life skills or 21st century skills, include things like paying attention, controlling, regulating emotions, getting along with others, and perseverance. And this photo depicts the young women there. Last slide. We encourage you, so the next slide, we encourage you to, to join us to take action uh, in a number of different ways. And I want to encourage you to, to think about different ways that you can participate in supporting not only the IRC, but Refugees International. You can volunteer with us. You can advocate with us. You can uh, share your support on social media and you can sign up for our newsletter via rescue.org. Thank you so much for your time. And again, just the fact that you're taking the time today to learn about our impact, the challenges and our impact makes a big difference and we really appreciate your support. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kim. I, I love the KUDO board. I think that's great. I hope everyone is um, enjoying and, and thinking critically about what you wanna share and what message you wanna include. I, I just think it's a great opportunity and um, messages of welcome are really powerful, right? So sorry everyone again about the video not working. We're having some audio issues. Pretty classic for a, a, a virtual event, right? So we're gonna move on. Um, Kim, stick around. I'm hoping we're gonna have some questions that come in here soon. So at the very end, uh, we'll jump back to you and, and hopefully have a discussion um, uh, on the things that folks are interested in. So Audrey, welcome. Excited to hear about Refugees International. I'm gonna let you take it from here. Awesome, thank you, Jillian. And uh, thank you so much, Kim. That was a really great uh, presentation and I feel like I learned a lot too. Um, so yeah, hi everyone, I'm Audrey. Um, I'm from Refugees International, as Jillian said. So I'm just gonna talk to you guys a little bit today about um, yeah, our work and our impact. So uh, you can go ahead to the next slide. Yeah, so just a little bit of a, uh, um, idea of what to expect today. Um, we're going to be discussing who is Refugees International, um, a little bit about our history, and then what we do today. And then like Kim, I'll be taking a few minutes to hone in on some specific crises that our um, advocacy hopes to impact. And then we'll also be doing a little activity that sort of shows what you can do um, to make an impact on these issues as well. Um, so Refugees International was started in 1979 uh, as a citizens movement to protect people who are fleeing from Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. And throughout the early 1980s, we were just a volunteer organization focused on U.S. resettlement of Southeast Asian refugees, and we didn't even have a real office until 1985. Um, but over the years, we got some recognition um, and expanded our advocacy to become more globally focused. And so now we're a leading voice for the rights of displaced people worldwide. And we've also expanded our focus to include um, issues that cause and surround displacement. So conflict resolution, peacekeeping, hunger and famine, um, you know, women's reproductive rights are all focuses of, uh, of our work as well. You can go on to the next slide. 
Thank you. Um, so now, how does that translate into what we do today? Uh, you might remember Kim said this, but there are currently more than 100 million people around the world who are displaced by conflict, human rights abuses, and persecution. And there's millions more that are displaced each year by climate-related disasters. Um, and this is just growing exponentially. When I started at Refugees International about three years ago, the numbers um, were about 79 million people on record who had been forced to flee their homes. And so now um, it's it's just grown continuously. Um, and at a time when the international community's ability to respond to these crises is being stretched thin, Refugees International, um, our advocacy helps focus the planning and response to ensure that resources worldwide are going to the people who need it most. Um, and, you know, I think what makes us really unique is that we don't accept any government or human funding, and so that enables us to speak really freely and independently, and that means that humanitarian groups that are responding to refugee and other displacement crises view Refugees International as a key ally, and so our expert recommendations are highly valued by senior officials of the U.S. government um, and administration in Congress, the United Nations, um, and governments around the world as well. So. We're making sure that the people who are in power to make decisions can bring immediate relief and life-saving solutions to refugees. Um, so now we're going to focus in a little bit on a specific crisis. Um, this is one that I'm sure everyone on this call is familiar with, is the refugee crisis that's come out of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, so just a little bit of background information, within one month of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine on February 24th, the war has caused the largest and fastest displacement of people in Europe since World War II. And today it's the largest displacement crisis in the world with more than 7 million people who have had to flee the borders of Ukraine and more than 15 million people that are still trapped by fighting inside the country and are in dire need of humanitarian assistance. So um, in March 2022, Refugees International sent a team to the border of Ukraine and Poland to bear witness to the refugee experience there. Um, our team traveled over 600 miles through eastern Poland, visiting border crossings and reception areas in cities that were hosting people who had fled Ukraine. And they met with refugees themselves, um, members of the Polish civil society, United Nations, the U.S. government, and Polish officials. Um, so we do have a video of our president, Eric Schwartz, talking a little bit about his experience um, at the border and some reflections on, um, you know, what they experienced and the need for, you know, worldwide action. But I'm not sure, Jillian, do you want to see if it works or should we, we can also just- Let's give it a try. Let's see if it works. And um, Audrey, I'm just going to let, have you let me know if it, if the audio comes through, okay? Seems to have lost it. Give me one second, everyone. I'm going to try stopping sharing. All right, let's try this. We're at the uh, Rebena border crossing uh, in eastern Poland, uh, in the south central part of the country. As it happens, uh, this border crossing is about five minutes uh, from the Belzec, the site of the Belzec uh, extermination camp, where 500,000 Jews uh, were killed uh, during the Holocaust. And our, our team was honored uh, to visit uh, the memorial uh, about, about half an hour ago. Uh, it is a reminder of the, of the critical importance of governments, of countries, of people, uh, keeping uh, their doors open uh, to those who are who are uh, fleeing oppression, persecution, uh, and violence. Thanks so much, Jillian. Uh, I'm glad that that was able to work. So. 
Yeah, that was just a brief message um, from our president based on uh, their travels through Poland and explaining, you know, the importance of governments and international community to, to come forward and support those who are fleeing. And I think, you know, he touches on that really important message of welcome too. Um, so when you donate to Refugees International, um, your donations are helping us advocate for an immediate end to the conflict uh, in Ukraine, accountability for Russian war crimes, and a response to meet the humanitarian needs of those who are remaining in Ukraine, and as well, protections for refugees that have had to flee the country, including support once those refugees have been resettled in Europe and the US. Next slide. Thanks. So, um, that is the crisis in Ukraine, and those are kind of our advocacy um, points that our, our advocates are focusing on, but there's many more crises happening around the world, including um, the crisis in Tigray, which has been really underreported in media and may be something that um, folks on this call are less familiar with, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that too. Since November 2020, civil war in the northern Ethiopian region of Tigray has become a living nightmare. Uh, the crisis has caused widespread violence, human rights violations, and displacement, and the destruction of agriculture and livelihoods in Tigray has created famine-like conditions, which is just compounding a devastating humanitarian crisis. Um, it's also having ripple effects across the region, including regional displacement and new tensions and changing the political landscape in Africa. So due to the civil war, 1.7 million people have been displaced, including more than 900,000 refugees from Eritrea and other neighboring African countries that initially came to Ethiopia seeking safety and then have found themselves amid another uh, violent conflict. So when you donate to Refugees International, you're helping us advocate for expanded rights for the refugee, for uh, Ethiopia's refugee population, an immediate ceasefire amid this conflict, and then removing the humanitarian blockade that's not allowing aid to flow into Tigray. And so um, it's not allowing organizations like IRC to get in and provide aid. So um, we're advocating for unrestricted humanitarian access. Um, yeah, and so we're going to talk on this last crisis, um, which is happening in Myanmar um, to the Rohingya people. And so this may be something that some of you are familiar with as well. Um, the Myanmar military has a long track record of violence and repression targeting the country's ethnic minorities and political opposition. And so the Rohingya people are one of the largest stateless populations in the world. Um, in 2017, the Myanmar military waged a campaign of violence on the Rohingya that has led to thousands of deaths and forced nearly 800,000 people to flee for their lives in Bangladesh. But Refugees International has consistently urged the U.S. government to recognize those attacks as what they are, which is genocide and crimes against humanity. In March 2022, uh, U.S. Secretary of State Blinken finally announced that the United States would make a genocide determination um, in what happened to the Rohingya. So this determination will help international accountability and bring global attention that could help prevent further atrocities and help rally international pressure around this issue. It also signals solidarity with countries hosting refugees from Myanmar and with Rohingya refugees themselves um, and those that remain in Myanmar. Next slide. Um, but despite this huge progress that's made by the genocide determination, unfortunately, Rohingya still do remain in crisis. And in February of 2021, the military of Myanmar staged a violent coup and seized power. And since then, the people in need of humanitarian aid has increased from 1 million people to 14 million people. Uh, 700,000 plus people have been displaced from their homes and thousands have been murdered or imprisoned at the hands of the Myanmar military and almost 1 million Rohingya survivors remain displaced in Bangladesh, and they don't know if they're ever going to be able to return home. Next slide. So it can all be really, really overwhelming um, to think about the magnitude of this crisis and, and the number of people that are displaced, but we can make a difference. And so 
Right now, U.S. senators are considering the Burma Act, and this act would sanction members of the Myanmar military who are guilty of perpetrating these atrocities and human rights abuses. It would support humanitarian aid to affected people throughout Myanmar, and it would support Myanmar civil society and call for increased international pressure around this crisis. So the Burma Act has passed through the House with strong bipartisan support as of this April, but now it needs to make its way through the Senate. So this is when I'm going to ask everyone on this call to take action, um, and you can do it if, from your mobile device or from your um, computer browser right now by texting refugees to 26989, um, and that's on the screen in that um, teal color, refugees to 26989, or you can visit refugeesinternational.org um, and go to our website. And if you just scroll down a little, you'll see we have a huge feature on our homepage. Um, and that takes you to a page that allows you to email and call your senator asking um, them to support the Burma Act and kind of just laying out all the points that I just made. And it's so seamless and easy to do. It, it drafts all the email language for you. So again, you can just text the word refugees to 26989 or go to our website, refugeesinternational.org. Um, and, and you'll see immediately upon scrolling down that we have a link to email or call your senators. So I'll give everyone a moment to do that. Um, yeah, and otherwise that's my presentation. Thanks so much, Audrey. Um, I just did it myself and it's super easy, um, super fast. And, you know, you're right. It can feel overwhelming with everything that's going on, but when you have simple, straightforward action steps to take like this, it can make a huge difference. So, um, Kim, why don't you come back on and let's do some questions together. So I see that we have one in the Q&A chat. How do you talk to people about refugees coming here to the US? I have friends and family that don't want more refugees coming here and would love to know how to respond or find resources to share with them. So do either of you have any thoughts on any of that? It's interesting. Uh, one of the videos that I know we couldn't get to work uh, was the last video about uh, how refugees bring more than they carry. And um, I would encourage um, you and we can share resources about what it's like to be a refugee, what that experience is like, there are obviously a number of books and movies about that too, but I think the most important thing is that um, people who come to a new country bring so much. They bring their culture, they bring their livelihoods, they bring their skills, and uh, we can provide a number of resources to help you share with your family members about the positive impact that refugees bring when they resettle in a new country. Yeah, I would love to echo everything Kim said that I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that you can talk about that are not just, you know, what maybe we see as like moral imperatives of like, we have a, a responsibility to welcome people and to, and to shelter people and keep them safe. If that doesn't resonate with others who think, you know, well, why do we have to take care of other people who are not from here, we have to take care of our own. I think that there's a lot of good points about just the amazing um, positive contributions that refugees make when they come to our country. And I'm actually gonna put in the chat um, a link to how to talk to your neighbors about refugees. Um, this is through an initiative that Refugees International is a partner with, um, the Refugee Advocacy Lab. And they have a whole sort of like domestic focus of how to sort of um, change the, the tide in the U.S. of how people see welcoming refugees and working with states on a more local level um, to, to introduce legislation that, that supports refugees. And so this guide is really helpful. It's just literally what you asked, how to talk to, um, you know, how to talk to your neighbors about welcoming people. So thanks. Great question. Perfect. I knew you both would have great answers to that. Um, I'm going to share, share the video in the chat too. In, in case there, the audio, video. Yeah. 
Um, we have a question. When working with refugees, how do you offer ample emotional support without triggering any trauma? It's a great question. Hmm. I, I think that the first thing is, is listening to them um, and asking them how they would like to be addressed, you know, what is what is best for them in terms of their comfort level, depends on what stage they're in, in terms of the mindset. Um, I think like with anyone suffering trauma, we don't know where what what they've been experiencing. And so I think the most important thing is to be empathetic, to have a listening ear, and really just to ask, how can I help? What would be help most helpful to you? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, refugees are people that are so much more than their trauma and more than what they've experienced. And so it's really important um, to just, you know, talk to them as people. And I think there can be power in sharing stories of our past, but it's like any of us, you know, we've all been through things that we don't necessarily want to talk to other people about and we'll bring it up when it feels right and when it when we feel safe. So I think making a safe space and making people trust you and feel comfortable with you, um, you know, first and then they they'll they'll talk to you about their experiences after. So I think, you know, welcoming your refugee neighbors as people and asking about their interests, their hopes, um, you know, is is really important. I think we've got time for two more questions. There's one in the chat and then one that I want to ask you both. Um, I read that the crisis in Ukraine is going to affect food supplies and that will make it harder to get food aid to refugees. Can you explain this issue? I'll say I'm admittedly, you know, not the uh, person who knows all the nuance behind the policy um, and of, you know, these displacement crises, but I, you know, everything, you're absolutely right, everything is interconnected. And so um, when, you know, for example, the crisis in Ukraine happened, we had advocates that focus on, you know, the Central African Republic or other places that get much less, you know, Tigray, that get much less news media coverage. Um, and that does impact the distribution of aid. Um, and so, you know, the crisis in Ukraine has been, uh, as I said, the largest uh, displacement crisis in Europe since World War II. But we've also seen a huge swell of support from international governments for Ukrainian refugees. And so part of our work at Refugees International is making sure that you know, displacement crises, no matter where they're happening, whether it's in a country that is, you know, Western based or not, is is getting the same amount of support and aid, um, or, or, you know, is getting their humanitarian needs met. So it's, I think that part of that is that underreported crises do get less um, aid allocated. Yeah, I would I would echo what, what Audrey said. Uh, I think the challenge is obviously the, U the Ukraine response is in in the news, and um, many humanitarian organizations are uh, meeting the needs uh, on the ground, including the IRC. Uh, but that's not the only uh, crisis going on in the world. And as I, I hope the audience learned today, as we sh shared about a lot of different challenges in other parts of the globe that um, you consider giving your support and giving it in a way that allows uh, organizations to uh, apply it to where it's most needed, not necessarily where it's most promoted um, because we know that sometimes the, the news takes over and there's certain areas that get a lot of attention, which is great, but we also work to um, help people understand how they can make even a greater impact in some of the areas with it extremely uh, similar circumstances, but not as much um, awareness, I would say, so. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of on that point, so there's a question in the chat about getting translators to resettlement places like Wichita. Um, and I think it also speaks to a question that we had privately in the chat about you know, how can we volunteer? How can we get more involved? Today was the first step. We took some actions together as a group, but um, any other resources for folks who are thinking about these things and want to get involved, particularly in their own local communities? Absolutely. I, I would say uh, go to rescue.org. I can put the, the um, link in the chat of where we work and you can see around the globe 
where we work uh, and within the United States, the, the areas that, that we operate and for each of those, you can sign up to volunteer. We also uh, often promote other volunteer activities through Global Impact. So um, there could be other uh, activities that you can uh, get involved in, but probably best to uh, go to rescue.org. Audrey, anything you want to add last minute? Yeah, unfortunately, we don't have volunteer opportunities because our work is focused on this high advocacy level. So the best way to support our work um, really is to donate. We also have events yearly. Um, so signing up for our newsletter, keeping in touch with, you know, what we're doing. But I think, you know, practicing, welcoming uh, in your own community, volunteering with um, local refugee resettlement organizations is so important, too. And I can't emphasize enough that it just takes approaching this from all different angles, from the advocacy um, level to direct services to just, you know, practicing in your own community, how to be a more welcoming person is, is just crucial to creating a more welcoming world. Absolutely. Um, on that last final note, we have another way for you to support um, both of these organizations, as well as the others that are highlighted on this screen here. Uh, Global Impact has a refugee fund um, where we support these partners, really inspirational and really critical work around the world. Uh, every dollar makes an impact. So thank you to everyone who supported the fund in the lead up to this event and everyone who made donations today. We really appreciate it. Um, and if you want to learn more about our partners at any time, you can always visit charity.org slash give. I also have our email up on screen if you want to get more resources from either of these organizations. Quick reminder, this was recorded, so we'll send that out to you along with some follow-up resources and the videos that we didn't get to play today. Uh, and anything else that Kim or Audrey, you know, really wanted to share with you but may have missed. So thanks so much for joining everyone. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And Audrey and Kim, my most sincere thanks. Thank you so much for joining.